thank you for inviting me. And I'm going to present this um, work that I've been doing for the last four years um, during my postdoc. And it's uh, based on the Helix project, which is Exposum project. And um, the part of the project that I was involved in was how to assess the association between Exposum and health. So first I'm going to present briefly what the Exposome is about and um, then present the results of a simulation study that we conducted in order to um, understand how we could investigate Exposome and Health uh, associations. And then a case study applying these results on birth weight and uh, prenatal Exposome in Helix and conclude on this. So what the Exposome is about um, in our daily life, we are exposed to a number of environmental exposures at levels that vary throughout our lifetime. But most of the time, in epidemiological studies, we focus on a single exposure that is assessed at a one-time point in, uh, in our life. And then we try to um, associate this with a health outcome. So this study that was published in 2013 try to um, look at the uh, association between exposure to bisphenol A during pregnancy and body mass index for um, kids. But it's only measured once uh, during the pregnancy and, uh, and it doesn't account for all the different things that people are exposed to at the same time and that could confound the association between those um, exposure and health. So Christopher Wilde came up with this idea in 2005 that similarly to the genome, we could try to assess the environmental exposures with the same precision um, that was done for the genome. And so he came up with this definition of the exposome as encompassing life course of environmental exposures from prenatal period onwards, so including the pregnancy period. And there's been a few projects uh, going on for the last five to 10 years. Mm, well, four main projects, one of those being Helix, which I've been working on. And it's a European research project that aim at characterizing the early life exposome and trying to link this with health outcomes. So it's based in Europe in six different countries. It covers about 1,300 uh, mother-child pairs uh, for which different layers of exposures were assessed. So external exposome, it's all the outdoor environment, so the noise, um, air pollutants, temperature, etc. Then there's the internal exposome, which is anything that you can assess from mainly urine, blood, um, biosamplings. So this covers um, pesticides, pesticides or heavy metals, uh, phthalates, phenols. So the motivation for the exposome was that there was an evidence for environmental effect on health, but with the potential for confounding by co-exposures. And there's one of the ambition was to try to identify potential cocktail effects. But of course, in terms of statistics, there's a big issue here because of the number of exposures that we are trying to look at, because of the um, temporal um, um, characteristics of these exposures, and also because if they are coming from the same source, such as traffic pollution or ready-made food, then they are highly correlated. And in public health, we really need to identify which exposure is uh, causing the disease because if you just mix up with another one, then you're not going to have an effect in the policy that you're applying. So this is why we came up with this idea of a simulation study. So based, um, because most of the studies that are looking at many environmental exposures, they were using environmental wide association studies, which is basically looking at one exposure at a time, um, as assessing the association with the outcome, and and so that that's a way to overcome the problem of correlation, but it's maybe not the best way to, to do that. And of course, there's different methods that exist, multivariate methods, uh, but we were just wondering how they're meant to be used in a situation where you don't have correlation. So in this situation with a lot of correlation, how are they going to deal with this? How are they going to be efficient or not? <coughs> 
And so we draw a simulation um, study. So first we generated some exposome data. So from, I'm sorry, it doesn't appear, but there's, this is the correlation matrix that we defined from INMA, which is one of the cohort, the Spanish cohort within ELIX, for which we had the data before the rest. So we defined the correlation structure of the exposome from this. Um, we assumed that this was quite typical correlation structure um, that we could expect from any exposome study. And we used that to simulate um, exposures, so X. Then we generated um, a health outcome, Y, which is linearly related to the exposures. With we define a certain number of exposures that would affect Y, uh, which, we which we define as true predictors. And one of the assumptions we made was that each true predictor would explain 3% of the outcome variability. Then we estimated the association between X and Y using a number of different methods that were going to be compared. And um, for each of these, we compared the results that we obtained with reality. So with what we assumed was affecting the outcome Y. And so we could use different criteria, but the main one that we used for um, comparing the methods were uh, sensitivity and false uh, discovery proportion. So sensitivity is the proportion of true predictors that were um, selected by the method. And false discovery proportion is the number of exposures selected by the method um, that are not true predictors. Mm, the methods that we use, so there was EWAS, so it's um, assessing the association between each exposure and health separately, and then there's a correction that is applied to account for the number of um, tests that are performed. Because the more you do test, and the greater the chance to have a, a false positive, so there's different methods that try to limit the, this risk to alpha, which is meant to be 5%. And those methods, I'm going to show afterwards, are not doing so well. Then there's um, different multivariate methods that were compared to these EWAS. So first, the extension of the EWAS, in which we, we took uh, all the hits from the EWAS, and we took them in a multivariate uh, linear model. So it's kind of a way to account for confounding by co-exposures. Um, we used E-net, so elastic net. It's a penalized regression method. So in the likelihood function that is used for the regression model, there's a penalty that is used to shrink the coefficients towards zero. And it's um, E-net uses a mix of ridge and lasso penalty. Then there's um, SPLS, so sparse partial least square, which is a superv supervised dimension reduction method. So some kind of principal component analysis that uses the information within Y to reduce the dimension of the exposures. GUESS is a Bayesian variable selection method. Um, it, um, which uses the, the a posteriori probability of each model and then averages the coefficients, values, with a weight proportional to this pro um, a posteriori probability of the model. And then DSA, which is an iterative model search algorithm. So it's kind of an extension of a stepwise method in which on top of either deleting or adding a term at each step, we can also substitute one term by another. So these different methods cover um, uh, the large families of linear regression methods that, that exist. Um, and, and so we, we compared them. Uh, in different scenarios, so uh, we, def we, we each scenario was defined by the number of true predictors affecting the outcome, going from zero to twenty-five. And here I only present the, the average results for each method. So the E was is the dot on the top, right? The black dots, and it gives a very good sensitivity. So most of the true predictors are captured by the method, but there's a high rate of false detection. Um, which is not exactly what we expected because this multiple hypothesis testing correction was meant to shrink that to, well, to limit this risk to 5% and it's 
With this method, we are over 80% in the, in, the, in the case of the exposome, which is w was somewhat surprising when we first uh, got these results. If you compare these to not, not using a multiple um, testing correction, which is the univariate fishing expedition, we get even a higher FDP, false discovery proportion. Um, and this corresponds to the situation if we have a publication for each environmental factor, completely independent, uh, and not accounting for the fact that we are doing many tests um, jointly. Now, if we compare this to the multivariate method, this is what we get. So we're doing better in terms of FDP for at the cost of a slightly um, lower sensitivity. But if we look at the trade-off between those two things, um, sensitivity and full discovery proportion, then the best methods uh, are DSA and GUESS. So what did we learn from that? Um, first, that the EWAS approach was not performing as good as we expected. Um, and as good as it's, um, yeah, as good as we hoped it would. Um, the GAIS and the DSA approach showed slightly better performances than the others' uh, methods. Um, yet the false discovery proportion is a problem in, in exposome studies and is something that we're going to have to keep in mind when we interpret the results. Um, the limitations for this study is that we really stick to simple simulation scenarios, so kind of ideal situation, linear models, y was continuous, x was normally distributed. And of course, in real life, it's going to be a bit more complicated because we're going to have measurement error due to the fact that we only measure once and not throughout the whole period of exposition. Um, that probably exposures are not normally distributed. Well, we're going to go a bit away from this ideal situation. Um, we've run some more simulations um, to test for interaction uh, between the exposures and also to try to account for this varying um, exposition that is measured only once, um, that I'm not presenting here, but there's, there's been further work done on that. Um, so for Helix, it was decided to use the DSA method uh, rather than the GUESS, because DSA uh, allows adjusting for confounders, and, uh, but the problem with this method is that it's really long to run, <laughs> which is a bit of a problem. Um, I think it could be optimized in terms of um, uh, implementation, but at the moment, it's, that's how it works. And E was, was still um, decided to be used in Helix for uh, more descriptive purposes. So now what happened when we started looking at the real data? So the first uh, outcome that was analyzed was birth weight. Um, um, and so, which was available for about all the cohorts, so pretty much the 1,300 children. And uh, it's quite normally distributed. And for this um, outcome, we looked at only the prenatal exposures, so of the woman during the pregnancy, which covered different families that are defined here. And it's, in total, it was 137 exposures. Um, the mean correlation is 0.15, which is not super high, but still, because the correlation is mainly uh, high within the family, for each exposure, there's pretty much at least one other exposure that is highly correlated to him. So when we performed an EWAS, um, so this gives the log transformed uh, beta versus the log transform p-value. And the line is the 5% threshold, so without multiple hypothesis testing correction. And so above 5%, well, no, below 5%, sorry, we had four exposures that came out, which is mainly particulate matter, so uh, fine particles, lead, and uh, one pesticide, which is this um, dimethyl triophosphate. Um, however, each of these exposures, they did not explain more than 0.4% of uh, the outcome variability after correcting for the confounders. 
So they really explain a very tiny percent of, of the outcome. And so if we look at the CWAS but correcting for multiple um, testing, then there's nothing. Uh, no exposure is selected by the method. DSA doesn't select anything either. So we start looking a bit further, trying to see if uh, running some sensitivity analysis, we could build up a bit more on this. And so we looked at uh, the heterogeneity between the cohorts to make sure that there was no big differences between the different countries of the, the, the study, which was not really the case. So, um, well, this we were quite happy with. Um, then we looked at confounding by co-exposure. So taking all the highly um, significant exposures, sticking them in a unique model, and then seeing which one would remain um, significant. And here, lead was the one that really stood out. It stayed significant at 10% when adjusting on other exposures. And also, we tried to correct for measurement error. So as I said, it's um, the fact that exposure varies a lot. Typically, bisphenol A, when um, it, your level of bisphenol A changes really much even within a day, uh, because your body just exposes it. And so depending on when you're going to measure it, it doesn't really reflect the, the exposure level that you're really um, um, being exposed to. And so there's different method that accounts for that, one of them being regression calibration. So it kind of adjusts the estimation of the beta, um, knowing that there's this variability ongoing. And when we use that method, then lead against turns out uh, and is this time selected by the DSA method. So given these results, um, which we did not exactly expect, because from the simulation study, study, we would rather expect that there was a high false discovery proportion, which was not the case here. Um, however, um, exposome is still um, a step forward in the sense that we look at a very large number of exposures, and so amongst these, we are able to identify which one are the, mol um, are the most likely related to the outcome. So this is still um, some really positive uh, point, rather than looking at only one exposure that we would select a priori. Um, however, the association that we found are weak, um, and um, this is due to the fact that it doesn't explain much of the outcome, each exposure. So if we want to build our confidence uh, on these findings that we have, we really need to compare our results with the, with the literature and also to run some sensitivity analysis to try to see if accounting for different aspects of the exposome, um, the results still hold and, and we can put, it, put this a bit more forward. So the conclusion of this, um, uh, at least for me, of this project over the last four years, um, I think the simula running a simulation study really helped, because uh, at the beginning we had no idea which direction to start looking in. So at least it helped us focusing a bit more on one aspect and then trying to build on this. Um, the current exposome studies have quite a low power to detect association, and so we think now that it's more uh, used, I mean, it, uh, the idea is more to use this as a screening tool um, to detect weak effects and then trying to compare with different studies um, to see if, if it corresponds to what happens in the literature and in, and in different settings. The benefits of the exposome, however, um, is that we use different statistical methods that complement each other. Um, we do not do selective reporting, so we just try to look as wide as we can and uh, don't go for one very strong a priori on one exposure. And we do acknowledge for multiple testing, even if there's a bit of a question going on there. And also it allows trying to account for um, confounding micro-exposures and um, measurement error. So this, um, this is the direction that we try to dig in and that we're 
I think, quite um, helped to go a bit further than when we did in as a first step. Finally, there's a big issue that is raised, raised for the exposome is uh, this idea of multiple hypothesis testing and whether um, we should use some stringent p-value correction for multiple hypothesis testing or whether we should completely get rid of the p-value. Um, one of these um, uh, study that I found that was published in 2017 reported instead of a 95 usual credible interval, they reported a 50% credible interval. Um, and it's a s study that was quite similar to us, studying birth weight and um, um, using more words, but um, uh, one of the family of exposure that we, we tested. And they, they reported this 50% 50 50 credible interval, saying that it gives higher power to detect small effects in the data, and that this detection could be used then, as once again, as a screening tool. So it needs further investigation, but as still, at least it can still be used um, as, a, as a comparison of different uh, variables, trying to highlight the ones that are most likely um, associated. Um, and then the last point is the best way to get rid of this, well, to get rid, to overcome this issue of low power is, of course, increasing the size of the exposome uh, studies. Uh, but the problem is, as often in, <laughs> in research money, because exposome is really expensive, you want to, because we look at so many exposures, then it becomes a bit of a problem money-wise, um, even though that would be the best solution in an ideal world. Um, so, yeah, these are the colleagues that I was uh, working, that I've been working with on this project. So, mainly um, people in Barcelona, IS Global, and uh, the team in, in CERN in Grenoble uh, with Remy Slama. Thank you.